Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at First Baptist Church. I'm so happy uh, that you can be here with us as we continue uh, our study in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, this Sunday we're looking at chapters 8 through 19. Now that's a lot of material. And obviously we're not going to be able to cover all of it. The focal passage is in chapter 11 and I think you'll really like the information that we have there. I want you to remember before we start that Ezekiel writes these prophecies in exile in Babylon while there are still people left in Jerusalem because the, the final battle for Jerusalem had not occurred and it had not been the temple destroyed and, and Jerusalem uh, completely emptied of its, uh, of its folks. And so he writes this and he has visions. We said that last week. Uh, he has visions that he sees. And today he sees a vision in Jerusalem. And actually uh, the scripture indicates that he's transported to Jerusalem. He's overcoming time and space uh, in these visions. So as we look at these lesson, at this lesson today, I want you to remember that as a backdrop so we know where we're coming from here. I'd like to begin by saying that uh, the people who are in Jerusalem at the time that, uh, uh, that he's writing here were very discouraged. And, and, and the people who are in exile were discouraged as well. And so uh, Ezekiel writes with some encouragement. Everybody needs encouragement, but the encouragement that you give to people needs to always reflect the truth. And we can do more harm than good if we uh, tell someone a false reality uh, just to encourage them because that false reality is going to come home to roost sooner or later. Uh, this can also happen when we cross the line between hoping and wishing. Some people confuse the two. Hoping from a biblical standpoint is a confident assurance that's based on God's promises. And that's the kind of hope that Ezekiel will be trying to in, instill in, in his readers today. Those promises can be trusted because they originate with the one who is truth himself, Almighty God. So as we look at this lesson today and we find these Israelites who've been left behind in Jerusalem listening to false hopes, we know that they're in great need of encouragement. And as I said, the context of this is chapter 8 through 19. And this, this whole section is, is in and out of the vision uh, that, that he describes of being transported to Jerusalem for judgment. The Spirit of God transports him and he sees things that are going on in Jerusalem. And he knows that there's great wickedness in Jerusalem and that God's judgment there is imminent. God's judgment was imminent because evil abounded and God would not put up with that any longer. And we'll see in this, in, in this section here that God's glory departs the temple. Uh, and, and, and it went up and, and hovered over the Mount of Olives for a while and then left. But we're looking mostly at chapter 11. And I want us to see what's, what's going on here in chapter 11. Uh, the judgment of Jerusalem and its leaders is a part of this, the, the leaders and the inhabitants. Second, there's, there's this glimmer of hope that, that he puts forth in the darkest hour. And the third is that the glory of God departs from Jerusalem. And then finally, we'll see him offering hope to the people who are in exile. So let's begin by looking at the first four verses in chapter 11. He writes this, Then the Spirit lifted me up, and brought me to the gate of the house of the Lord that faces east. There at the entrance to the gate were 25 men. And I saw among them Jeazaniah, son of Azar, and Pelatiah, son of Beniah, leaders of the people. The Lord said to me, Son of man, these are the men who are plotting evil and giving wicked advice in this city. They say, will it not soon be time to build houses? This city is a cooking pot and we are the meat. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, son of man. Again, we see throughout this, these sections here that, that, that he's lifted up by the Holy Spirit when he's about to see a vision. And it's one of those instances where uh, Ezekiel's vision exceeds the restrictions of time and space. Remember that Ezekiel 
is one of the captives now in Babylon. He's being transported by the vision to Jerusalem. And one of the important things that you see here is that he meets these 25 men at the place in the temple that faces to the east. They were worshiping the sun. How do we know? Because in Ezekiel 8, 15 through 16, this is what, uh, uh, what God says to, 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 to Ezekiel. He says, he said to me, do you see this son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. He then brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord. And there at the entrances to the temple between the portico and the altar were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. They were bowing down to the sun in the east. They were worshiping the sun. Not unusual for that section of the world and that time in history. People worshiped heavenly bodies. They worshiped the moon. They worshiped the sun. But notice, these people, these 25 men, have turned their back on God symbolically. He says their backs are to the temple. They're looking to the east and they are worshiping the sun. They're plotting evil and giving wicked advice. Uh, not anything known about who these men were uh, who were leaders in Jerusalem, except that their intentions were not genuine. They were, they were not from God. Uh, we, don't, we don't know. We do know, though, that, that the names that are mentioned here are, are actually legit, legitimate names because of geological, archaeological discoveries. The, the names of Jeazaniah and Pelatiah appear among some of these discoveries, as does the name Baruch, who was Jeremiah's scribe, who was a contemporaneous with this period of time. And so as leaders, they're responsible for the moral, social, and spiritual fabric of the people. But they failed. Instead, they're plotting evil and giving wicked advice. They're giving wicked advice to the king and to others in Jerusalem but their wicked advice, obviously, is not from God. They are idolaters. They worship the sun. And I don't know what advice they got from the sun, but it certainly was not from God. The leader's statement at the beginning of verse 3 could be read either as a question or as a statement. That said, will it not, be, will it not soon be time to build houses? If you understood, stand that as a question, uh, it said it could be having our houses recently been rebuilt. Uh, we're encouraging the people to build because the time of God's judgment was almost over. And that would be good news for them. Other translations read the comment as a statement, which if it's a statement, then perhaps the leaders were somehow mocking Jeremiah's prophetic words about the exiles building homes in captivity. Remember, Jeremiah said, get busy living. Build homes, plant crops, raise children, marry. Uh, and uh, so they're saying, will it not be time to build houses? Maybe they were mocking Jeremiah. We don't know. Now, the, the statement here about the cooking pot and we are the meat. Now, at first when I read that, and I read it before I hadn't thought about it too much. It actually is a positive sign if you read it as a statement because uh, it, it can be understood negatively, of course, as, as, a, as a judgment. But more likely, it's the image of a positive interpretation. The leaders like in Jerusalem citizens to choice pieces of meat that are already in the pot, protected by the pot. That would be the walls uh, of Jerusalem. The innuendo in this metaphor was that the people in Jerusalem were the choice cuts of meat. The people in exile were the scraps. And so these people were being protected and they would be the, the people who would lead Israel later. And the idea here by the false prophets that were there, the 25 men that were giving the false testimony, that the best times were coming. The, 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 the best days are ahead. But the final fall of Jerusalem is what was ahead. It had not occurred yet. And, 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 and they, they did not bother to ask God for leadership. Uh, they thought the same thing that had been thought for a long time. God would never abandon the temple. He would never abandon Jerusalem. No matter what happened, they were wrong. They were mistaken. God would. Now let's look, move ahead and look in, in verses 5 through 11. 
He says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and he told me to say, This is what the Lord says. That is what you're saying, O house of Israel, but I know what is going through your mind. You have killed many people in the city and filled its streets with the dead. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. The bodies you have thrown there are the meat, and the city is the pot, and I will drive you out of it. You fear the sword, and the sword is what I will bring against you, declares the sovereign Lord. I will drive you out of the city and hand you over to foreigners and inflict punishment on you. You will fall by the sword and I will execute judgment on you at the borders of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. This city will not be a pot for you, nor you, will you be the meat in it. I will execute judgment on you at the borders of Israel. Now, you know, one of the tests of a prophet is whether or not what he prophesies comes true. This comes true to a fault. The, the, God says he's going to drive them out, and, and, and he does. Ezekiel says some will be killed and others will be exiled, but, and God's not going to continue to provide that mercy and protection that he had for so long. Verses 6, 7, and 8 are predictive. The policies of the city's leaders have made it inevitable that a large-scale slaughter of the leadership in, it will take place when the enemy comes, when the Babylonians come. And the leaders so secure that Jerusalem for them was a safe haven will not be able to stay in the city. They'll have to, be, they'll, they'll, they'll have to leave. They'll be taken out by the enemy and they'll be killed by the sword. In fact, if we look at 2 Kings 2.25, 2, 2 Kings 25, you'll find the terrible slaughter first of King Zedekiah's sons, all murdered in his eyesight. And then his eyes immediately put out so that the last thing that Zedekiah would ever see were his sons being slaughtered by uh, the Nebuchadnezzar's forces. Uh, and, and here it said that they would be taken out to the, and, and the, the judgment would come at the borders of Israel. Well, it did at Riblah, in Hamath, in which, which, where Zing, King Zedekiah's sons were slain. And then along with them, the chief priest, Sarai, the second priest, Zephaniah, the three guardians of the threshold, an officer who had been in command of all the soldiers, five men of the king's council, the secretary, who was the commander of, an, of the army, and 60 men chosen from the streets of Israel. They were all slaughtered. Slaughtered right there, executed. In addition, we'll see later that the glory of God does depart and it re re departs from the temple and then it resides to the east on the Mount of Olives. Now let's move forward. Look at verses 12 and 13. And then he says, And you will know that I am the Lord, for you have not followed my decrees or kept my laws, but have conformed to the standards of the nations around you. Now as I was prophesying, Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died. Then I fell face down and cried out in a loud voice, Ah, sovereign Lord, will you completely destroy the remnant of Israel? Ezekiel is beside himself. Why? Because Pelatiah, his name means Yahweh rescues. That had to be an ominous sign uh, to, uh, to Ezekiel. My goodness, if you're, going to, if you're going to kill somebody or if somebody's going to fall dead who has a name like that, what does that mean? It's not just about uh, the corrupt leaders here. Uh, and it, this, is, this is a reflection of the, the kind of thing that results from corrupt leadership. This is why Ezekiel can discern that, that the death of the one, the coming death of all, the death of Pelatiah signals the coming death of all. But, but be assured, be assured, the remnant is still going to be intact, even though Ezekiel is, is, com is uh, completely concerned about that. He would not completely destroy the remnant of, of Israel. Ezekiel's question needed an answer. Was God actually going to annihilate all of his people? Was he going to be rid of them forever? Or could some of them somehow be rescued from the fate that he and others are already experiencing? Well, we'll see. 
God's going to speak to both groups, the groups left in, in Jerusalem and the groups that are in exile. Look at verses 14 and 15. He says, The wor word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, the people of Jerusalem have said of your fellow exiles and all other Israelites, they are far away from the Lord. This land was given to us as our possession. Now, what's going on here? The people who are left in Jerusalem, they say, God, you've, all these people are way off in Babylon. So we're going to take possession of their land. And they claimed as their right the Levitical law. That they invoked the right to redeem property. The law provided for such redemption uh, of property within the family and tribal groups. But during the year of Jubilee, and this uh, was apparently not the year of Jubilee because along come Ezekiel and he denounces what they're going to do. do. Uh, Ezekiel denounced Jerusalem's population for its self-righteousness because they had passed judgment on the people who were outside of Israel who were already in captivity over in Babylon. And so he denounced the whole population for being self-righteous. Ezekiel knew God spoke the truth, but would God ever redeem this situation? And that was a hard one to answer. Let's move forward and look at verse 16. Therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Although I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while, while I, I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. God says, Ezekiel I've still been with those people even though they're in Babylon. And there's no temple for them to worship in. I've been their sanctuary. I didn't totally abandon them. And I've taught them how to worship without a temple. Uh, the, the, the God still loved His people. He, 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 he was still with them and, and He was their sanctuary. You know, it was in the time of, of the Babylonian captivity that we suppose that the idea of the synagogue began to be used as a new experience in, in worship. And so God was there with them and teaching them how to worship God in a new way, not as they had been doing in the temple, but in, in synagogues. Look in verse 17. He says, therefore, I, therefore say, this is what the sovereign God says. I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you back the land of Israel again. Here's a promise of hope. Ezekiel is speaking to the people who are already in exile, not the people who are in Jerusalem. To the people in exile, promise that even though Israel had been taken captive, a remnant would return and they would once again possess the land. Now, this passage is really an ironic reversal because the promise of, promise of death and exile to those who have escaped it now becomes a promise of punishment. And to those who have been in exile, there's a promise of a life and a return home away from the exile. It's a difficult thing to do for God to say, uh, I'll gather you from uh, the nations. Because you see, if you think about the children of Israel, some had been taken to Babylonia in exile. They were still together pretty much as a group. But there were people in the northern kingdom who had been taken away by Assyria. And Assyria's policy was uh, to intermingle people with their own people. They wanted to amalgamate them into their own population. That'd be a difficult thing to do, to, to, to get all of those people back together. Uh, but God says, I'm going to gather you from the nations. And of course, God has the power to do that. Second, uh, God affirmed, I'll give you back the land of Israel. I made that promise to Abraham. I told him it was his land and it's still the land of his descendants. He'd bring them home. This was a promise that was 1,500 years old. It was a, a, a commitment that was 1,500 years old. And he promised the prophet that one day he would bring back the people to the land of promise that he had given to Abraham. And some people would say that's still occurring today. That's not a part of this lesson, but uh, if you think about it, perhaps uh, it is. 
maybe that you are living in a situation that's somewhat like this. You know, when, we, when we're living in a, in a situation where we've abandoned God for sin, sometimes people get in a situation where they think, I can't go back to God. I, I, I can't do it. But God has a way. There's always a way of repentance to God and he will forgive you and he'll restore that relationship with you if your heart is true. God promised to gather all of his Old Testament people together one day and he will restore you if you're in sin and bring you back to him. Now let's continue with, with, with Ezekiel's prophecy. In verses 18 through 20, he says, they will return to it and remove all all its vile images and detestable idols. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove them from their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. This is a, a group of instructions filled with promises. And the Lord described the change of heart and an action that would accompany it and his children would return to their homeland. Uh, the instructions were that when you do return, get rid of all of the images and detestable idol, items. Uh, the words translated here refer to something that is abominable and vile. God wants that out. When the people lived in the land, they corrupted it with wickedness of all kinds. They did not follow what God had in instructed them to do through the prophets. Ezekiel said the first thing that God's people would want to do when they returned home to remove all traces of that past history where they had worshipped these vile images and detestable items. They had no place in the lives that would be redeemed by God. And then God says, I'm going to give you an undivided heart I'm going to give you a heart of flesh because previously you've had a heart of stone. This language describes a united people committed to God's purpose. It is a renovation project of the heart and the soul. Uh, it, it's a renovation project for the whole nation. Just as David had implored to God in Psalm 51:10, create in me a clean heart O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. God's going to do that for the whole nation, not just for, for, for David. The past focus of their lives had been sin and rebellion. Going forward, the focus of their lives would be obedience to God and being steadfast in their worship of God. There would be a single-hearted devotion, loving and serving God with all their heart, obeying him completely and unconditionally. One day, one day when Israel recognized her Messiah, Ezekiel's words will achieve the, the ultimate fulfillment if Israel would recognize the Messiah. Our spiritual growth as Christians is referred to as the process of sanctification. And that process is one that, that fulfills two aspects. One, we become less like we were before and we become more like Jesus. And then God replaces, we think about it in terms of God replacing the bad things of our lives with the goodness of his son, sanctification. So the first part uh, of, of verse 19 there describes uh, the people that as being having a heart of stone, but God's going to remove that heart of stones. Their hearts were not sensitive to God's leading. So they had followed their own desires and their own wickedness, and look what happened. Uh, second, he, he's going to give them a heart of flesh, which is a living heart. That is one that beats for God. I ran across this description of the heart of stone and the heart of flesh uh, by a man named H.W. Wolf in one of my readings. And, and this is what he said. I think it hits right to the point. The heart of stone is the dead heart, which is unreceptive and makes all the limbs incapable of action. The heart of flesh 
is the living heart full of insight, which at the same time is ready for new action. The new spirit brings to the perception and will of the heart the new vital power to hold on steadfastly in willing obedience. That's the kind of heart we need to have as Christians. We need to be obedient to God and we need to be willing to do what God wants us to do. God said that when he gave his people a heart of flesh, three things would happen. First, they would follow his decrees. They follow his commandments. The word translated decrees is a, uh, from a Hebrew ver uh, verb, which means to inscribe. It's going to write it on their hearts. God would inscribe his statutes on their hearts. Jeremiah talked about that, writing the law, writing God's statutes on their heart. Second, God said of his people, they'll keep my laws. They're going to keep the commandments that I've given to him. They're going to properly decide how to meet life's situations. Uh, the word translated has with it the idea of keeping watch or guarding. And so third, they're going to, God, God says, be careful, be careful to keep my law. It's not just a situation, well, I'll read over this and memorize it and then I'll go on about my way. No, I want you to be careful. That means you're going to study every day. You know, why, why do we study the Bible? Why not just read it through once and take it and leave it and go on about our lives? God wants us to be careful. He wants us to be careful that we are studying His Word and abiding by what He wants us to do. The psalmist declared that God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so we need to study God's Word so we can keep that light shining bright and see the path that He wants us to go. The world sometimes views living by God's command as a sheltered path and a sheltered life. But people who live by God's commands are receiving the best that God has to offer. The words, uh, they will be my people and I will be their God, summarize God's purpose. That's what he wants. He wants fellowship with us. He wants fellowship with the children of Israel. He wants a personal relationship with the people of Israel. It's not a, a faith that's based on a, a list of do's and don'ts. It's a personal relationship whereby you know what God wants you to do and you follow through on doing that. Now let's look at the last set of verses here, verses 21 through 25. But as for those whose hearts are devoted to their vile images and detestable idols, I will bring down on their own heads what they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. Then the cherubim with the wheels beside them spread their wings and the glory of God of Israel was above them. The glory of the God went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. The spirit lifted me up and brought me to the exiles in Babylonia in the vision given by the spirit of God. Then the vision I had seen went up from me and I told the exiles everything that God had shown me. What a scene that must have been. This is the same uh, chariot throne that he sees in chapter one. And it rises, the glory of God goes up out of the, 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 the city of Jerusalem and it goes and sits on the hill that we call the Mount of Olives to the east of Jerusalem. Eventually it goes away completely. Uh, people like this in past generations and it, the, the ones who were in Jerusalem, uh, they had led Israel down the path to ruin. But when God restored its people, he says, he's not going to tolerate a return to this rebellious behavior. Those who received God's salvation would recognize sin's ugliness. And those who persisted in it would find only God's judgment. He warned them, I'll bring down on their heads what they have done. And the wicked thought that they were building a great life, but in the end, God would bring it all to a crashing end, those people who had been left in Jerusalem. Ezekiel's closing statement declares the sovereign Lord, Lord stresses the certainty of his words because they came from God, not from him. He's simply the mouthpiece. The closing scene of this section comes with the glory of God departing the city. You know, sometimes we look in, at things, we, we find it uh, 
uh, too kind of easy to, to suppose one thing and, and really the reality is another thing. And it's easy for us to forget that God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. We tend to admire wisdom in this world and the wisdom of the world, but it leads us down the wrong path. He's put down the proud and the mighty and exalted the lowly. He's made the wise to look foolish, 1 Corinthians 1, 20, and he's exalted the lowly, Luke 1, 51, 52. Uh, to almost any of us, those people who remained in Jerusalem that Ezekiel saw in the temple would have been the cream of the crop, the best of society. They would have been the favored ones of God in a worldly scenario, the people blessed and called to be in charge. But that was not God's design here. God's design looked foolish to the world uh, who were at the low end of things, the Judean exiles in Babylon. They were the ones that God's going to exalt because he's going to bring them home. He's going to give them back their land. These people who are left in Jerusalem that thought they were the leaders, they're going to be punished. Ezekiel learned what many consider a key message of the book. He and people of like mind were at the center of God's will, even though their circumstances make them seem like a bunch of castaways and nobodies. They're nobodies. You know, these people who were gathered at the east gate worshiping the sun, those 25 men, they, they were the elite. They were the elite. And you know, we talk about that a lot today in politics. The elite think this. Well, sometimes the elite turn out to be foolish. And the people that, that the elite think are foolish, they turn out to be the ones who really have the, the right idea. And so God's going to replace these people. The key message is that these castaways, these nobodies who've been sent off into exile in Babylon, they're the ones that God's going to use. And so the savior of the world who was to come along much later and whose birth we celebrate in a few days, he came as a nobody. He came as a place, as to a place where there's not even a place for him to lay his head, born in a stall, born to a family of no reputation. He lived though the one life that was capable of being offered as a sacrifice for the sin of all humanity. And he reigns today waiting for God's signal to come back and to triumph once and for all over the evil forces of this world. God once again uses the lowly to accomplish his greatest task. The question is, will he, we like Will we be willing to lower ourselves to accomplish God's will, just as Jesus did? And as we celebrate this time of Christmas, as thinking about this concept, this idea of God elevating and exalting the lowly to do his will and to do his, his task. I thought about uh, one of the uh, carols that we don't sing very often, and we sing it sometimes even during the year, but it's one that that I've always enjoyed, and it speaks of this. It says this, Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity. O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there's room in my heart for thee. Heaven's arches rang when the angels sang, proclaiming thy royal decree. But of lowly birth didst thou come to earth, and in great humility. O oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There's room in my heart for thee. The foxes found rest and the birds their nest in the shade of the forest tree. But thy couch was the sod, O oh, thou son of God, in the deserts of Galilee. O oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There's room in my heart for thee. Thou camest, O oh, Lord, with the living word that should set thy people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There's room in my heart for thee. 
when the heavens shall ring and the, her choirs shall sing at the coming to victory, let thy voice call me home, saying, yet there is room. There's room at my side for thee. O oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There's room in my heart for thee. My heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest and callest me. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity. O oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. That's my prayer for you today, that you make room in your heart for Jesus Christ. It can make all the difference. I hope you have a great week.